Hello sports fans, this is Larry Larry and Sally Sally coming to you live from the Oasis Gardens. Where today the Nautifans take on the Jerusalem Giants. <laughs> Larry, I think what you mean is the Nauta fans. Right. You can already hear the man of vendors making their way through the stadium. Leading off for the Giants today, the big number 10, Goliath. This guy's got a strike zone the size of a Roman chariot. That's right, Larry. The Nada fans have a nearly perfect season this year, even after their big hitter Jonas went out with a bad case of indigestion. And their rookie David is out for the season with his arm in a sling. Coach Jesus has had to recruit some pretty interesting players this season. That's right, Sally. Coach has actually pulled fans from the stadium. But these aren't just ordinary fans, Larry. These are fans that are willing to commit to the coach's extreme regimen. Some say this regimen is too extreme for the ordinary fan. That's right, Sally. Coach is going to stretch them beyond their known abilities. He's going to push them past their comfort zone. He's going to break these fans down and build them back up again until they're all-star players. Let's go down to the field where our correspondent Jenny is. Oh, thanks, Larry and Sally. I'm here on the sidelines with one of the newest members of the Not A Fan team. Can you tell our viewing audience how the coach recruited you? Well, he saw my passion. He knew I wanted to help people, but my life was a mess. With his patience and guidance, he pushed me to my potential. It was harder than anything I'd ever done, but the reward has been greater than I could have ever imagined. Following Coach's playbook, it's pretty big, but it changed me into the person I knew I could be. He sacrificed everything to make me a part of his team. Now I know I can do all things because he strengthens me! And with that, back to you, Larry and Sally. What do you think, Sally? That's what a follower does. He's going to use these plays day in and day out for the rest of his life on this team. That's the coach's definition of commitment. Wow. I think that that makes my life feel pretty ridiculous. Actually, my name is Carmen. I don't like sports, and I really hate this jacket. What am I doing? I spend my days living a half-truth, just going through the motions, and I think I'm done. I want to find out who the coach really wants me to be. Are you ready, Larry? I'm with you 100%, Carmen. You can be with us, too. Just pick up a playbook at your local connect table. Jesus said... If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Don't be a fan. Be a completely, completely committed, committed follower. follower. Check back with us later as we cover the breaking news of the fall of Jericho. This is Larry Larry kicking it over now to your play-by-play -play action with Greg the Burning Bush Smith. Thank you, and, and God, God bless. bless. You miss a day, you miss a lot. Oh, thank you, skit people. Greg the Burning Bush. Is it what? <laughs> this is our second series in this Start Strong series. Last week we talked about how we can start strong at the beginning of this year, 2012, with prayer. And today we're going to talk about how to start strong at the beginning of this year with fasting. It's been said, it's not how you start, but it's how you finish that counts. And I believe in finishing strong, but I tell you what, it's important how you start as well. It's important how you start your day, it's important how you start your week, and it's important how you start your year. And I am asking each of you, the entire congregation, to participate in this 21 days of devotion with prayer and fasting starting tomorrow morning. 
There is tremendous power in the life of the Christian when he or she does life God's way. And when you commit and begin each day with prayer and you begin each week with worship and you commit the first portion of every dollar and the first consideration in every decision, and it's important how you start the beginning of the year to set the tone for the rest of the year these first several days. So I am asking that you commit to this 21 days of devotion. And part of the reason that I am requesting this is because the church is in, in the middle of such tremendous transition and growth. And it's important that we take the steps necessary for the future in order to grow and go just like God would want us to. And that's why the elders are working on rolling out a strategic plan. And part of that in growth involves kicking off connect groups with this 2012 connect group series, Not a Fan. I am preaching starting on the last Sunday of this month, a series entitled Not a Fan. And along with the sermon series topic, each week we are going to involve ourselves in these connect groups. There are going to be groups meeting all over the city where you can go uh, probably any night of the week and participate in a Bible study group where we can grow deeper together. And if you haven't registered for that, there are connect cards lying about. It's those long cards right here. Uh, We have them in arm's length distance in some of those containers, but there is a a thing on the back where you can say, hey, I want to sign up to a connect group. If you don't know the number, that's okay. On your way out, on the right, there is a registration table for connect groups for the Not A Fan series, what they did the skit about, and you can register for that, fill that out, drop that, or bring that back next week. Get signed up. It's going to be so important that you start the year strong by involving yourselves in one of these connect groups. Part of the growth steps in order to set the the tone for the rest of the year, too, involves this Saturday. This Saturday, we have Ben Merrill, who is coming to speak to the Oasis. Ben Merrill is 85 years old. He has a proven track record of growing churches. He is a phenomenal speaker. I mean, he is doing a, 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 a thing next month in February in Phoenix where my best friend in Arizona who's a preacher is going to attend, but he goes out all over the nation almost uh, regularly throughout the month, and he teaches about church growth, and he is coming to us to talk to us personally about what we can do during these next steps. So I know that your calendars are full, but if you can make sure next sat- or this Saturday, just six days away, at 10 a.m., if you can clear your calendars and be at the Church of Christ in Pueblo West. That's where he's going to speak to us. And he's going to, I'm going to meet with Ben in the morning, and then we're going to meet at 10 as a group, and then the elders are going to meet a little later on. I'm going to meet with him later that evening as well. And we are going to see what, how Ben can come alongside us and help us for the future growth of this church. I am motivated, I think, like never before, and... Uh, so excited about these steps of prayer and fasting that it seems like my eyes have been opened. I've been a Christian for 25 years, and it seems like studying this topic that we're going to discuss today has been so eye-opening uh, for me. But this, we talked about prayer last week and fasting today, and I tell you what, I pray every day. I pray in the mornings. I pray throughout the day. I pray at night. But you know what I don't do? I don't fast. I hate to fast. I hate to not eat food. I mean, when, when my stomach's hungry, I want to eat. And you know when I don't eat, I'm not myself. You ever get that way? You ever get a little, you know, cranky? When you don't, you ever seen those Snickers commercials? <laughs> uh, we're going to play one right now, just to get a feel for what that's like. So you guys grew up together? Yeah, since third grade. What are you looking at? I went, I'm not looking at it. We're not good enough for you. You look for something else? No, I, just, I don't know. What are you, big supermodels? Oh, oh yeah. Jesus. Jesus. Supermodels. Oh what are you, model gloves? What are you doing? A girl's totally into me. Brad, eat a Snickers. Why? Because you get a little angry when you're hungry. Better? Better. So, ladies. So, losers. Stacy, relax. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. I am... Don, is that Don Rickles? Is that it? What's that guy's name? That's who I am when I am. I am not myself when I'm hungry. And I tell you what, Jesus illustrates three practices that I think everybody, every Christian should be involved in 
in their life. And this is one of my big misses that I am so excited about and talking about. But in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus highlights three practices that every Christian should be engaged in. And there is no quick pill, no quick, uh, easy find yourself in success in these areas, but it takes diligence and discipline and commitment to do that. But in, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus highlighted these verses and these practices. He said, when you give and when you pray and when you fast. And that's why I want to talk about fasting this week. We've talked about giving in the past. We talked about praying last week. But I was so challenged by a book by this guy named Jensen Franklin. And he said this. He said, if Jesus had to fast to enter into his ministry, how much more do we think that we shouldn't fast? And I'm thinking, how could we expect spiritual breakthroughs in our lives as a Christian when Jesus fasted? And I think I can have those same spiritual breakthroughs if I don't fast. And Franklin said this, he said, tremendous rewards await those who seek God through the discipline of fasting, both corporately and individually. And that is why I am challenging each of us to pray and fast starting tomorrow during this 21 days of devotion where we can collectively and corporately as a church seek God's face and individually seek those spiritual breakthroughs that maybe many of us have been missing in our daily walk with Jesus. And during this 21 days of devotion, I am writing a daily devotion that's going to be uploaded to Facebook every day. And I hope that we can engage in that and also put more information about this subject of fasting on there daily and that we can get on Facebook and we can dialogue and encourage one another. I mean, it's tough to fast and, and find out how different people are fasting. So join us and follow us on Facebook. Be sure to do that. So I am challenging you to fast. But let me say this and get this out of the way. I do not think fasting is a matter of salvation. I think you can go to heaven if you don't spend one day of your life fasting. So this is not a matter of salvation. But I do believe that it is, it is a quintessential weapon in our spiritual arsenal to fend off the devil and to seek God's face and experience spiritual breakthroughs like never before. So let's talk about what is biblical fasting. 31 times fasting is mentioned in the New Testament. And uh, people like the Apostle Paul, uh, a lady named Anna, Jesus, they fasted. The early Christians fasted. The church grew as a result of that. Old Testament heroes in the Bible, such as David and Moses and Hannah and Daniel, they all fasted. Well, let's look a little bit about what fasting is not, first off. What it's not, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what fasting is and what fasting is not. Fasting is not merely going without food for a period of time. That's starvation. Or maybe some people might say, you know, that's dieting. But that's not what fasting is. And fasting is not done by a bunch of religious kooks, a bunch of religious fanatics or monks that go hide in a cave somewhere. That's not fasting. Fasting is not something that's a manipulative thing that the pastor does to try to get the congregation to do for some purpose. And fasting doesn't occur while you're sleeping. That's not a legitimate fast. So let me explain what fasting is not. It is not a hunger strike. You know, there are people in the past for political purposes to draw attention to a specific subject. They have gone without eating. Fasting is not a hunger strike. Fasting is not a health diet. There are all kinds of diets out there that say don't eat. You're going to lose weight. And that's great for those of you who achieve that. You look better. You're thinner. More people can fit in here. So we encourage that as well. But that's not biblical fasting. Biblical fasting should not be talked about among everybody because we just shouldn't announce stuff like I mean, there was this TV preacher I remember talking about how he always had just finished this 40-day fast. And I'm thinking, how can a guy who fasts for 40 days so often be so large? You know, but it's not, you shouldn't just announce when you're fasting to everybody. Most people would probably think you're weird anyway. I mean, you go, oh, I started a gin regimen and started a new diet and trimmed up a little bit. And everybody says, wow, man, you are committed. That is great. That's cool. But you say, I'm a part of the Oasis Christian Church and we started 21 days of devotion and I'm fasting. They think you're part of a cult because they think you're weird <laughs> when you talk about it collectively as a church. But in Matthew, Jesus said this about fasting particularly. In chapter 6, he said in verse 16, when you fast, 
Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, get cleaned up, so that it'll not be obvious to men that you're fasting in, in, in agony, I'll add that part, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret, He will reward you. Jesus, in Jesus' culture, there were people that, who, that were abusing these three practices of giving, praying, and fasting, and they would stand on the street corner and they'd say, Oh, I'm fasting, oh, and they'd babble on just to be heard for the many words in prayer. Jesus says, that's not the way I want you to do that. But there is encouragement when you join with other people to fast like we're going to do on Facebook. There might be a five or six of you guys or gals that, that, that you want to skip lunch and that's going to be part of your fast and this commitment for the 21 days. And you go, you know what, let's meet for encouragement during lunch so we don't think about food and we pray. And say you end up meeting at Cracker Barrel because it's so convenient. And you go to Cracker Barrel and you're seated by the server and you're sitting there and the server comes up and says, well, what can I get you to eat? And you all look up and go, no, just a little water with our lemon. We're we're fasting for the Oasis Christian Church for 21 days. You know, don't do that. That, I think, is what Jesus is talking about. You don't really announce that kind of stuff to the outsider. People are going to think you're weird. But it's great to unite together and to encourage one another. Talk about how you're fasting. Offer that encouragement. But it's not to impress the outsider. But biblical fasting is refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. It's a voluntary holding back, restraining, abstaining from certain foods, and we'll even augment that in a little bit, certain things or activities for a spiritual purpose. Many years ago, before I got involved with the ministry, I had a lot of Catholic friends, and they would just eat fish on Friday, kind of a mandatory thing. And you know what? Abstaining from meat on Fridays did these guys little spiritual good. Now, they were my friends. I can judge them on that. But the purpose of fasting is to bring about these spiritual breakthroughs in our life that we've never experienced before. Now, there's a classic text on fasting in Isaiah chapter 58. In Isaiah 58, the people are saying, Hey, God, we're fasting. Why can't you hear our voice? And God illustrates why by communicating back to the people in chapter 58, verse 3. He says, On the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit all of your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. This is the benefit of fasting, to get God's attention, that He can hear our voice in this spiritual discipline. So whenever we fast and we're still greedy and mean and throw those wicked fists and wicked tongue-lashing barbs at people. Fasting is of no use. Remember this, whenever you begin to fast, if it doesn't mean anything to you, it's not going to mean anything to God. So you don't sleep late in the morning to skip breakfast and call that fasting. You don't skip lunch and go play golf or, or racquetball and replace that eating with an activity. When you fa if you don't think about what you're doing, it's going to be of no spiritual value. So we deny ourselves a meal in order to pray. Or we don't eat in order to give the money to the poor. Or we deny ourselves a meal to focus on just adjusting our attitude. Or we deny ourselves physically to focus on God. It's not just skipping a meal. Jesus said, God is spirit. And we are to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And there are so many physical things around us, these indulgences every day. And we do little to hold those things off, to stave them off. When we're hungry, what we do, we eat. When we're thirsty, we drink. When we're tired, we sleep. When we want it, we buy it. But when we practice self-control, what, what that does in our life, it allows us to focus on the things of the Spirit, the things of the God, and to avoid those entrapments of the flesh that bog us down. And we have, God hears our voice, and we have those spiritual breakthroughs, maybe perhaps like never before in our Christian walk. The Bible says this in the easy-to-read version in 1 Timothy, training your body helps you in some ways, but devotion to God helps you in every way. It brings you blessings in this life and in the future life too. John Piper in his book on fasting calls it hungering for God, and when we fast, 
We're simply saying, God, I hunger for you. I deny myself the physical, and I focus on the spiritual. And we allow God full control, perhaps like never before in this spiritual discipline of fasting. Now let's look at some different types of fasts. Because we desire to grow as a church, and because I am requesting that you involve yourself in some type of fast during this 21 days of devotion, I want to illustrate some of the different types of fasting found in Scripture. Now, the one fast is the absolute fast. The absolute fast is where you do not eat any food and you do not drink any liquids, including water. I mean, an absolute fast is for an absolute cause. Isn't that for sure? I mean, it's for an extreme situation. Queen Esther, back in the Old Testament, in the Bible, the Jews were about to be exterminated. And Queen Esther decided it was going to be her responsibility to go before the king and plead on behalf of the Hebrew nation that they be spared. But it was against law to go before the king. So Queen Esther went to her uncle Mordecai and said, I want you to call all of our people in the land and surrounding lands to fast before I go, before I do this extreme thing before the king. And the Bible says this, and I want to read the response and how she put it. Uh, she delivered these instructions in chapter 4, in Esther chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. She said, do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. It was a corporate fast where a group of people rallied together for a specific purpose, and God heard their prayers, and he changed the course of events, and the Hebrew people were spared. Saul of Tarsus in the New Testament. If you're familiar with this story, he's going to Damascus, and when this bright light shines down and blinds him, what was Saul of Tarsus doing? He believed in God, but he was persecuting Christians because he didn't believe in the Messiah. He was murdering Christians. He was blinded by this light, struck down. He calls out, Who are you, Lord? And the response comes from Jesus. And he says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 9, it says, For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. For three days Saul fasted by not taking in any food, by not taking in any drink, he repented of murdering Christians. And God sent a guy by the name of Ananias to heal Saul. He later became the Apostle Paul. And when his eyes were opened, before he even ate anything, he was baptized into Christ and had his sins washed away before he finally ate. So before he became a follower of Christ, he repented and he fasted in this absolute fast for three days. There are extreme situations that might require you someday, somehow, to go on an absolute fast and abstain from all foods and water for a brief period of time. And let me say that this is not what I am asking you to do. If you've never fasted a day in your life, I would, not, I would never recommend that you involve yourself in an absolute fast right off. Well, now there's a normal fast. Let's look at this normal fast. A normal fast is abstaining from all foods, and by, but you take in water, you take in liquid. A person can live a, a short time, uh, a few minutes without air, and probably days without water. And a person can live a really long time by not taking in, in food. Jesus went into the wilderness before his ministry and before his temptations by the devil, and he fasted in this normal type of fast for 40 days. And the Bible reads this in, in Luke chapter, chapter 4. We read in verse 1 that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan after he was baptized and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. So Jesus experienced this normal fast, and, and, and we imagine that he drank water because... It says that he was hungry at the end of the fast. It didn't say he was thirsty. When the devil tempted Jesus, he said, turn these stones into bread. And uh, he didn't say, drink water. So we believe that Jesus took in water on this normal, long fast. 
so Jesus kind of sets the tone uh, of how to do a normal fast. Now, there are people that have done variations of a normal fast, uh, and, and it's recommended if you have a physically demanded job or if you are fasting uh, completely from food and, and you uh, exercise that maybe you take in some clear broth or juice or some type of liquid to get nourishment. So there's some variations even of the normal fast. And the duration of a fast can vary. People in the Bible, I mean, there's half-day fast, there's full-day, three-day, seven-day, 21 days. Jesus fasted here for 40 days. There's no real formula that I can give you how to determine how you might fast for this 21 days of devotion. It's going to be completely up to you, up to your needs and your circumstances. But, I, but let me be clear. I am not asking you to fast from food the entire 21 days. So as I'm talking about these variations of fasts, just kind of listen and think about what type of fast might fit you. I mean, you can start gradually. Maybe you do one meal a week or one day a week for this 21 days or, or one week of this 21 days without food or some type of variety. Even if you just started with a single day of fasting or a half a day, I think God would see your heart and allow you some spiritual breakthrough through, and you could sense his presence in your life like never before, and you kind of begin to flex those spiritual muscles, and for the rest of the course of your, of your Christian walk, you will find this discipline that Jesus talked about that maybe can transform your life or transition it to a new period from here to the future. Now let me address some of the health concerns if you decide to withdraw and abstain from certain foods from your diet, especially in light that I'm asking you to do something in the form of fasting from food during this 21 days of devotion. If you're taking medication, or if you have health issues like diabetes, do not withhold food from your diet without consulting your physician. Uh, for you, this might be a good time to abstain from like television or the internet, or maybe not even watch football for the rest of the season or something. Or, or, you know, maybe even shopping. But don't use fasting to get out of doing something with your spouse. Oh, honey, I'm fasting for the church for 21 days, and I just really want to grow spiritually. And if you want to eat anything, you're going to have to go to Walmart and go shopping. You know, you, you don't do stuff like that. But you make adjustments. If you have health concerns, you'd be better off fasting some activity or sacrificing something. The point is, you sacrifice something that you normally do in a variation of a food fast, and you, and you fast from something to devote yourself to God. Now, thirdly, there's the partial fast. The partial fast can be interpreted so many ways, and that one of the ways it cannot be interpreted is from that period of time, 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., when most people sleep. That's not when you can interpret this partial fast, but it involves giving up some food, certain food or certain item for an extended period of time. And the most commonly used example is that of, of the partial fast is found in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel was living in Jerusalem. He was a Hebrew. Babylon seized them, took he, he and some other guys captive, and, and the king wanted to feed them their food. So here's Daniel and three of his friends, and they said, we don't want to eat the king's food. We don't want to eat the meat, the sweets. And Daniel goes on this partial fast where he eats mostly vegetables and drinks water. So that's a form, an alternative fast that you can involve yourself with. And uh, later on in chapter 10 of the book of Daniel, he involves himself in another type of fast. And this is when he's fasting because he's grieving for the future nation of Israel. And in chapter 10, verse 2, we read this about this fast, that I, Daniel, mourn for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. For 21 days, he involved himself in this partial fast where he dieted from food, certain foods, and certain comforts like lotion. And at the end of his 21 days of fasting and devoting himself to the Lord, God answered his prayer by the, with the visit of an angel. And there's, some, there's several basic guidelines to a Daniel fast or to a partial fast. Kind of like a vegan diet with a few more restrictions. 
So uh, some people have said, you know, you just eat fruits and vegetables, or maybe you drink only water. And it's even recommended you only use distilled or purified water during this time. Or, or if you do drink beverages, to refrain from certain beverages and maybe just do clear broth or juices, no sweeteners, most breads that some do recommend, the Ezekiel bread that you can find, no processed foods or chemicals uh, or anything. And, and we're hopefully going to post some of these uh, links or diets on what to eat and what not to eat that you can choose from on Facebook, so check us out on that. But in selecting what type of fast might be best for you for this 21-day period, maybe you just choose to get rid of meats or get rid of sweets or breads, some variation of this Daniel diet. Whatever you choose, it ought to be a sacrifice, something that you like for these specifically selected days. You know, I could say, for example, well, for the 21 days of devotion, I'm not going to drink any wine. That'd be a fake fast because I already abstain from drinking alcoholic beverages. That's something that I just choose to do. So, uh, but if I say, I'm going to abstain from caffeine, <laughs> that, my friend, is a sacrifice. And I plan on doing that for the entire 21 days, but starting tomorrow for four days, I'm going to gradually wean myself off of caffeine. I did that once cold turkey. And by, the, by sundown, I had such a throbbing headache, I thought I was going to be sick. So I'm going to gradually do that. So check me out on Facebook and hold me to that. Ask me if I'm finally off of caffeine because that is a sacrifice. And I might as well talk about some of the negative side effects. If you would draw certain foods or chemicals from your diet. Uh, I mean, during fasting from certain foods, you could experience dizziness feeling, uh, being cold, uh, a coating of your tongue, halitosis. I mean, you know where they got that word. I mean, bad breath. I mean, you, I mean, you get headaches, sleeplessness. There are all ty types of physical side of, negative side effects, and there are physical, emotional side effects. You've got to think. Uh, one of the effects that people experience commonly during fasting is periods of discouragement. And you understand that you are on a spiritual walk, by abstaining physically from food, Satan is going to be knocking at your door trying to discourage you during this. And there's often senses of failure during a fast too because you set days and you set certain foods that you're not going to eat and oftentimes people fail. Just like going to the gym this week, there were tons of people that I couldn't exercise, my normal exercise, because people had these New Year's resolutions. Three weeks I'll be able to get on the piece of equipment because they forget. And we do that with fasting. There's, there's, period, there's this emotional downside to fasting as well. But other than the spiritual benefits to fasting, think about all of the physical health reasons to fast. Listen to some of these statistics. I read, people who study this stuff, that a person over a lifetime will consume over 11,000 pounds of sugar you will drink over your course of a lifetime 313 gallons of corn syrup. That's a hot tub filled with corn syrup in your lifetime. I read that the average American consumes yearly, this is yearly, four pounds of, of, of chemical stuff, of preservatives, food coloring, stabilizers, all of that gunk. And when you fast, and you're feeling sick, it's because your body is expelling all of these gross toxins that it's, it's filling up your body. So if you get hungry and cranky when you're fasting, you probably, not, you probably shouldn't grab that Snickers bar even though the FDA said go ahead and eat that because that thing, I'm just saying, I don't know, I didn't read the label. <laughs> Why fast? Why fast? Why, Greg, should I fast because you've brought this element out of scripture that maybe I've never even heard about. Why should we do this as a part of this 21 days of devotion? Well, number one, to express personal devotion to God for the purpose of spiritual breakthroughs. You know, I have never been convicted and convinced of something so much so as I have been about this practice of fasting. I mean, I've, I've read this stuff and I... I I'm, I'm like, miss the boat on this. 
And uh, one of the articles was entitled, The Lost Art of Fasting. And I think the modern church has forgotten about this spiritual and physical practice of fasting. And, I mean, but it's ingrained in the Bible. It's ingrained in our spiritual heritage. I mean, listen to some of these guys. Martin Luther fasted so much, the great reformer, that his friends thought his health was in danger. Matthew, Matthew Henry taught four lessons for fasting all the time. Jonathan Edwards, part of the Great Awakening in New England, before he preached his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, fasted three days before that. John Wesley fasted two days a week and he said when he didn't follow through with those two days a week of fasting, he said, he said this, that he quickly lost his spiritual fervor. Jesus found it necessary to fast, to ward off the temptations of Satan. And so should we. You know, there's probably never a good time to fast. Not a convenient time. There's always going to be a dinner, a lunch, a birthday, a holiday. There's going to be something to interrupt you starting to fast. But I, I'm asking you because I think of what might lie in the future of that. That you start tomorrow. At least pledge the 21 days of devotion. And maybe through that, kind of figure out what type of fast you can do. And I want to list some things up on the screen here. What I want you to do starting tomorrow, think about it today, talk about it with your friends or family. Uh, we're going to start tomorrow. Decide what to fast. And it can take you days, just like me weaning off of caffeine. I don't exactly know what I'm going to do right at this moment. I wanted to start with you guys tomorrow fresh, and we can talk about that on Facebook. But choose some day, some food, some activity, and make yourself... Decide what to fast. And, and secondly, prepare spiritually. Ask God to increase your spiritual alertness and you pray more when you fast. List clear goals for why you're fasting. Think, you know, I want to fast for something. God, I want you to hear my voice. You know, maybe it's with your family, your work, with your school. Maybe some decision that you're trying to make. List clear goals. Write that out. Anticipate what to expect. There's going to be some negative side effects. To that. Anticipate those. But anticipate the spiritual reward and the breakthrough. So fast for the purpose of spiritual breakthroughs. And when you're hungry, think, why am I so hungry? I'm fasting. Why am I fasting? Because I'm praying. Why am I praying? Because I'm praying for a cause. So pray and fast in this 21 days like never before. And allow God to allow this 2012 year be a year of dramatic spiritual breakthroughs for your life personally. Secondly, why am I asking you to fast? We should fast to encourage God's guidance corporately for this church body. Queen Esther went to her people and said, I want you to pray fast. Abstain from everything for guidance for what I'm about to do. So we fast and we enter in this together to pray God to lead us into the future of what we're going to do. We stand at a crossroads, I think, like never before here at the Oasis in time, in your time, in this time. And we come together collectively and we ask God's guidance. Specifically for, I want you to pray for this list of ten items that we're going to put up here, if you can write these down. One is for our country that we would invite God back into our country collectively, that we pray for the 2012 election, that we pray for people to allow God to have His way with us as a country, and pray for our community, the FPU, the Financial Peace University, the Dave Ramsey. After the Night of Fan Series, we're going to offer a financial class for the entire community. There are people that need help financially, and we're opening that up to the community. Pray that that be a great, successful thing that a lot of people can learn these tools in this Dave Ramsey course. And pray that abortion would be eradicated in Pueblo County. Pray for our community. Pray specifically for this church, for the Night of Fan Series, that people grow deep in this, in fellowship in Bible knowledge and pray for next week for, for this Saturday I mean for Ben Merrill 10 a.m. clear your calendars let's learn about how we can be an effective church in our community and reach out to our family and friends through that 
and be in prayer for Ben Merrill and how we can he can teach us to do we need to stay in a temporary facility or what would be the benefits of getting to a into a facility that's more permanent and wisdom for the elders and pray for your families our unsafe family members and for financial breakthroughs spiritual breakthroughs I understand it's a tall order what I'm asking you to do but I want you to pledge with me come alongside me and the other elders in this 21 days of devotion we have no idea what God plans for us to do in the year 2012 and you know what we're not going to be able to have those accomplishments on our own it's only when we humble ourselves before a holy God and we deny ourselves and we pray to him will he hear our voice and then only will we have the spiritual breakthroughs that each of us I'm confident so desperately need when we do life God's way he rewards us would you pray with me father my I've, I've been blown away by reading and learning about how people in scripture have fasted those in the early church and those throughout history how they have incorporated this discipline of fasting in their life I pray as we embark on this 21 days of devotion as a congregation that you would hear our voice that you would hear our voices collectively and individually and I pray father that you would answer like never before in our lives some need direction today oh God I pray that you would make their path straight some need a sense of renewed purpose show them yours some are in pain I pray father that you would give them relief there's one among our family today Steve who just lost his grandma this morning and father there is Andre I lift him up that you would give him physical healing from the leukemia that's returned in his body and for his parents that you give them strength to endure as he returned home yesterday from the hospital that you would protect him from harm and I'm sure there are so many others physically that that we could lift up I pray father that each of us would keep on seeking keep on praying keep on knocking I pray God that you would hear us like never before as we seek to deny ourselves and seek your spirit like never before and I pray oh God if there is an emptiness and one today who has not received you as both Christ and Lord and Savior that they would take that decision and make that today and like the Saul of Tarsus before he even ate or drank anything be baptized before he even ate to have the forgiveness of sins and the gift of your spirit to lead and guide on this day forward, I pray in Christ's name.